Good afternoon, and welcome to the stated meeting of October 21st, 2021. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you would like to follow along, the agenda for today's meeting is posted on our website. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Adams. Present. Amphrey Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Barron. Present. Borelli. Present. Brannon. Present. Brooks Powers. Present. Cabrera. Present. Chin. Present. Cornegie. Present. Present. Dharma Diaz. Present. Ruben Diaz. Dinowitz, Present. Drum, Present. Eugene, Present. Felice, Present. Gennaro, Here. Gibson, Present. Jonai, Grodenchik, Holden, Here. Kalos, Ku, Kozlowitz, Lander, Levin, Levine, Lewis, Mizell, Menchaca, Miller, Moya, Perkins, Powers, Reynoso, Riley, Rivera, Rodriguez, Rose, Here. Rosenthal, Here. Salamanca, Here. Traeger, Here. Ulrich, Fallone, Van Bramer, Jaeger, Matteo, Cumbo, Speaker Johnson. We have. I will refrain from the urge to mark people absent. Thank you. We'll now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Deacon Kevin McCormack, spiritual leader at Zavarian High School, located at 7100 Shore Road in the Great Borough of Brooklyn. have been given the gift and the burden of administration and leadership, and you have tasked them with the protection and the well-being of all your people in this great city. The people of our city are gathered from all corners of the world with wonderfully different languages, cultures, histories, and beliefs. Each person with their joys and hopes, as well as their grief and anguish, reflect you in their unique and grace-filled lives. Lord, please bless these leaders with the eyes, ears, and heart to see, hear, and know their neighbors. Lord, please bless these leaders with the vision, patience, and wisdom to understand their mission. Lord, please bless these leaders with good judgment, courage, and faith in their work. And Lord, please bless these leaders with a sense of justice to serve your people wisely and the necessary sense of humor to communicate, debate, and compromise with one another. Help us to remember that you share with us the power of administration and of service, and the work we do is your work. Bless us always with your presence, your insights, and your kindness. Amen. Thank you, Deacon McCormack. That was delivered in only the spirit of a spiritual leader from the great borough of Brooklyn could do it. I'd like to ask Councilmember Justin Brannon to spread the invocation on the record. And when he gets here, he does. 
I, I don't believe Councilmember Brannon is here, so uh, Mr. Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I would love to spread the invocation from Father Michael Callahan, that beautiful invocation he gave us today in full and upon the record. And I really want to thank him for all the work that he has done, not just, of course, uh, presiding over a really important congregation, but the work that the New York Disaster Interfaith Services does in New Yorkers' uh, most dire moments of need. He has been there, the organization has been there, after Hurricane Sandy, after Hurricane Ida, time and again, they have stood up for New Yorkers in some of the most trying times, so I want to thank him, and I'm going to ask that the invocation be spread in full and upon the record. Sorry, oh. I, I apologize. It's, it's, uh, it's Dean Kevin McCormick. I apologize. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. We will now have the adoption of minutes by Council Member Jim Gennaro. Um, Mr. Leader, I make a motion that the minutes of the City Meeting of September 23rd, 2021 be adopted as printed. Messages and papers from the mayor. None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. None. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. M342 through M344. Coupled on a call-up vote, and I'm going to ask the clerk that we take a roll call vote on today's land use call-ups. Again, we're just voting on land use call-ups. Adams. Adams votes aye. Amphrey Samuel. Aye. Amphrey Samuel votes aye. Ayala. Aye. Ayala votes aye. Barron. Aye. Barron votes aye. Borelli. Aye. Borelli votes aye. Brannon. Aye. Brannon votes aye. Brooks Powers. Aye. Brooks Powers votes aye. Cabrera. Chin. Aye. Chin votes aye. Cornegy. Aye. Cornegy votes aye. Dharma Diaz. Ruben Diaz. Dinowitz. Dinowitz votes aye. Drom. Drom votes aye. Eugene. Uh, Council member, we can't give that at this moment because we have a quorum issue. So we will check back in uh, in a little while and let you know if that's possible. Eugene votes aye. Felice. Gennaro. Yes. Gennaro votes yes. Gibson. Aye. Gibson votes aye. Jonai. Aye. Jonai votes aye. Grodenchik. Aye. Grodenchik votes aye. Holden. Aye. Holden votes aye. Kalos. Dharma Diaz. Dharma Diaz votes aye. Ku. Aye. Ku votes aye. Kozlowitz. Kozlowitz votes aye. Lander. Aye. Lander votes aye. Levin. Aye. Levin votes aye. Levine. Aye. Levine votes aye. Lewis. Aye. Lewis votes aye. Mizell. Yes. Mizell votes yes. Menchaca. Miller. Yes. Miller votes yes. Moya. Yes. Moya votes yes. Perkins. Powers. Aye. Powers votes aye. Reynoso. Aye. Reynoso votes aye. Riley. Aye. Riley votes aye. Rivera. Aye. Rivera votes aye. Rodriguez. Rose. Aye. Rose votes aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Rosenthal votes aye. Salamanca. Traeger. Aye. Traeger votes aye. Ulrich. Ballone. Aye. Ballone votes aye. Van Bramer. Jaeger. Jaeger votes aye. Matteo. Combo. Speaker Johnson. We will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Good afternoon, and we have to read the uh, call-up vote. 
Today's land use call-ups have a vote of 37 in the affirmative, zero in the negatives. We will now hear from, have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Good to see you, Councilmember Carnegie. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's stated meeting. Happy Thursday, everyone. I'd like to again remind all members that masks are required to be worn throughout the stated even when speaking. Today we're voting on 13 bills, including a five-piece legislative package related to the child welfare system in New York City. The bills are aimed at ensuring that parents and guardians have information and resources to better navigate the Administration for Children's Services. We're voting on measures that will help newsstand operators, help families impacted by COVID-19, help homeowners protect themselves against deed fraud, and help LGBTQI plus individuals in the city's domestic violence emergency shelters. I am proud of the Council for continuing to find ways to help all New Yorkers. This week, as everyone here knows, we lost a tremendous New York native who lived a life of public service and won bipartisan praise. Our deepest condolences are with the family and friends of former Secretary of State Colin Powell. He was born in Harlem, raised in the South Bronx, and was a CUNY graduate. Secretary Powell was a true New Yorker and a proud American. He was 84 years old. We have some council news to share. Our uh, colleague, Councilmember Oswald Felice, got married on Sunday. So let's wish the happy couple a best of luck with a round of applause. Congratulations, Oswald. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that Brian Crow, our Deputy Director for the Justice Services Division, is leaving the council after seven years. Brian has been instrumental in our criminal justice efforts including the Criminal Justice Reform Act, the Right to Know Act, the New Sabatement and Fairness Act, as well as our push to invest in diversion programs, support alternatives to incarceration, create a citywide bail fund, and close Rikers Island. Although he'll be leaving us, well, it was good for the citizens of Manhattan. Uh, Brian will be continuing to reform our criminal justice system by joining uh, Manhattan's next district attorney, Alvin Bragg. So I want to congratulate Brian Crow uh, for all of his service to the city. And I also want to acknowledge that Kate Lucadamo, who uh, stepped in as communications director after Jen Firmino left the city council, Kate has been with us for a few years. She has been incredible, helping to lead the press office. Just a really, really a thoughtful, wonderful, talented person uh, who I am so grateful for her service over the last many years. Uh, Kate's last day uh, is tomorrow at the City Council, so I want to give Kate Lucadamo a big round of applause as well for everything that she has done in service to the body. And I want to acknowledge those New Yorkers, of course, who have died on the job since we last met. We mourn the death of deliverista Abu Salah Mia. He was killed during a robbery for his e-bike after finishing a shift in Manhattan for Grubhub. He was 51 years old. And yesterday, Ahmed Almulaki, a deli worker in East Harlem, was killed by a customer. He was 34 years old. We continue to battle COVID-19 in New York City. New Yorkers have done a great job getting the numbers low, but there are still people contracting COVID and there are still people who are suffering. In New York City, we have lost 34,480 neighbors from COVID-19 as of October 20th. If we could all collectively stand and have a moment of silence for those New Yorkers who have died from COVID-19, those New Yorkers who have died on the job, and for former Secretary Colin Powell. Thank you. Now on to our agenda for today. Today the Council will vote on introduction number 1919A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, the chair of our Finance Committee, which will strengthen a Department of Finance program to help homeowners protect themselves against deed fraud. The Department's Notice of Recorded Document Program sends notices to property owners anytime a deed-related or mortgage-related document is recorded against their property. This legislation will require that the notice also include information about whom to contact for assistant, assistance, to file a complaint, or to report a crime if the property owner believes that such recording is fraudulent. 
Anyone can be a victim of deed fraud, from seniors to immigrants to people of color. Those are the folks that are most at risk, and this bill will help them know what to do if they suspect that deed fraud may be happening to them. From the staff, I want to thank Rebecca Chasen and Stephanie Ruiz, and I want to thank our finance chair, Danny Drum, for this important bill. We'll also be voting on a transparency resolution out of the Finance Committee. We'll be voting on the following land use items. The Landmarks Preservation Commission's designation of Dorrance Brooks Square Historic District, the first historic district in New York City named after an African American, which is fantastic, a serviceman who died in action during the First World War in Councilmember Bill Perkins's district. The site selection and acquisition of 101 Varick Avenue for a DOT operations and warehouse facility in Councilmember Antonio Reynoso's district. 130 St. Felix Street, a rezoning and special permits to facilitate the development of a 23-story mixed-use building with 120 units of housing, including affordable home ownership and an expanded facility for the Brooklyn Music School and Councilmember Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's district. 435 11th Avenue Slaughterhouse in my district, which will facilitate the development of a new mixed-use development to include 275 affordable dwelling units, 71 permanently affordable units, and 75 units of supportive housing, a hotel, office and retail space, and NYPD vehicle storage. 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning, which will facilitate the development of a new five-story mixed-use building with 46 units of housing, 12 of them permanently affordable, and a daycare space in Councilmember Debbie Rose's district. I know it wasn't easy, Debbie. Congratulations on getting there. And uh, finally, three items in Councilmember Van Bramer's district. Uh, 6204 Roosevelt Avenue, a new 13-story mixed-use building with approximately 213 units of housing, 54 of which are permanently affordable, 48-18 Van Dam, a four-story enlargement to an existing two-story commercial building, and Broadway and 11th Street, a new eight-story mixed-use building with 205 units of housing, 51 of which are permanently affordable. Moving on to our legislative agenda, our first three bills come out of our uh, Housing and Buildings Committee. I want to thank the presiding officer, the chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee, Councilmember Cornegie, Chair Cornegie. And the first bill is his, Introduction 2259A, which will extend the deadline for owners of buildings in community districts 2, 5, 7, 13, and 18, and all five boroughs to have gas piping systems inspected and were applicable, certify that hazardous conditions have been corrected by six months to June 30th, 2022. This bill would also require the Department of Buildings conduct targeted outreach regarding the requirements of Local Law 152 by December 1st of this year, 2021. The second bill from the Housing and Buildings Committee is introduction number 2321A, again sponsored by Chair Cornegie. This legislation will allow all owners of buildings with gas piping systems and gas service to apply for a 180-day extension of the deadline by which they must conduct inspections and submit certifications. Additionally, this bill will give the Department of Buildings the ability to grant additional time beyond 180 days to building owners who have identified conditions that need to be corrected. And finally, introduction 21, 2321A will allow owners of buildings and gas piping systems but without gas service to forgo the required inspections as long as they provide certification from themselves and from their utility company that the building is not receiving gas service. I want to thank uh, from the staff uh, uh, Janine Zilka for uh, the, her work on this. Also from the Housing and Buildings Committee, we're voting on introduction number 2404A, sponsored by Councilmember Brad Lander. This bill will extend the certification of the no harassment pilot created by Local Law 1 of 2018 until September 27, 2026, and extend the program to significantly distressed buildings citywide. And I want to thank from my staff, Lewis Cholden Brown, for his work on that bill. Next, we have introduction number 1712A, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal and from the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. This bill will require that the Department of Social Services review services and resources will review uh, services and resources it provides specifically to LGBTQI plus individuals who are entering the city's domestic violence emergency shelters. 
The Department of Social Services will be required to submit to the Mayor and to the Speaker of the Council and publish on its website a written report disclosing the total number of demographic information survey forms regarding sexual orientation and gender identity that were distributed by the Department and the total number of individuals who identified as LGBTQI plus on such forms, as well as a description of the Department's efforts to collect data specifically about LGBTQI plus domestic violence survivors. It will also disclose information about the Department of Social Services outreach efforts, any complaints the Department received about domestic violence emergency shelter services provided to LGBTQI plus residents, and recommendations for enhancing outreach efforts and services offered by DSS specifically for domestic violence emergency shelter residents who identify as LGBTQI plus. Domestic violence and intimate partner violence affects many people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, gender nonconforming, and non-binary. But little is known about its prevalence, both within LGBTQI plus communities and from traditional domestic violence service providers. According to advocates, emergency shelter resources are often prioritized in a way that does not provide support to DV survivors who identify as LGBTQI+. Additionally, domestic violence programming in New York State is often structured in a way that does not assist people outside of a heteronormative construct, which is cisgender, cisgender women abused by cisgender men. Without access to competent services, LGBTQI plus DV survivors often endure abuse far longer and with greater intensity than the average uh, a cisgender survivor, sometimes being forced to choose between homelessness and going back to their abusive partner. Transgender survivors often face even more pervasive and unique barriers and discrimination in trying to access safety and support. In addition, the Department of Social Services will also be required to consult with community-based organizations with culturally specific expertise in challenges faced by survivors of domestic violence who self-identify as LGBTQI+, and to develop and provide LGBTQI+, cultural competency trainings to domestic violence emergency shelter employees who work directly with shelter residents. I want to thank from the staff Bianca Vitale and Chloe Rivera for their work, and I want to thank Councilman Rosenthal for this really, really uh, important bill and for her constant advocacy for survivors. Moving on, our next two bills are from the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. First, introduction number 1145, sponsored by Councilmember Peter Koo, will excuse retail stores from having to place price stickers on each item they sell, a dated requirement for which many New York jurisdictions have already provided ex exemptions. Uh, pricing every item in the store can be time consuming. State law already requires prices to be displayed on shelves and on signs next to the items, and many stores already have price scanners available. Despite this, uh, grocery store operators have testified that violations of this law make up some of the biggest penalties they pay. Current law is enforced on a per item basis, and penalties can reach $8,000 in one inspection. inspection. To qualify for an exception, this bill would require the items to be scannable by a price scanner, and the store would have to place a sufficient number of price scanners around the store for consumer use. Stores would also be required to display the prices on shelves or on adjacent signs near the items. The second bill from the Consumer Affairs and Business License Committee is introduction number 499A, sponsored by Councilmember Karen Koslowitz. This bill will amend existing law to allow newsstand operators to hold their licenses as corporate entities as long as income from the newsstand is the primary source of income for each shareholder, partner, member, or principal. This ensures newsstand continue to be operated by small businesses rather than large chains. Existing law only allows newsstand operators to hold their licenses in their personal capacity. Only one person may buy into and operate a newsstand, and partnerships have been prohibited. Yet these small business owners, many of them immigrants, have been asking for the ability to partner with one another in order to maintain their livelihoods. And allowing operators to be licensed as corporate entities means that they can shield their personal assets, like homes and college savings accounts, from business debts and lawsuits. Many businesses incorporate for this reason. This bill also requires the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections to send a letter to current newsstand operators to help them transition to joint ownership. 
And from the staff, I want to thank Stephanie Jones, Leah Skripiak, and Noah uh, Meixler. And I want to thank Karen. She has worked on this bill since Rudy Giuliani was mayor, and the bill was vetoed back then. And she has worked on this bill for many, many years. She used to be the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee uh, when she first joined the council, and she's worked on this for many years. So I want to congratulate Karen for getting this bill done. Next is Introduction 2373, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Salamanca, and it will require that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene waive any fee for applicants requesting to amend a death certificate to list the cause of death of COVID-19 or health complications caused by COVID-19. And from the staff, I want to thank Sarah Liss, Harbani Ahuja, and M. Balkan. Finally, we're voting on a, packet, a legislative package in relation with the child, city's child welfare system. Every time there is a report of neglect or abuse, the administration for children's services must investigate to ensure the well-being of every child. These five bills will provide parents and guardians with information to better work with child protective specialists for the administration of children's services. Introduction number 1716A, sponsored by Councilmember Adrian Adams, will require the Administration for Children's Services to report on the total number of emergency removals of children each quarter. This bill will also require ACS to provide such information disaggregated by race, community district, and primary language of each child and parent or person legally responsible for the child. <clears throat> Introduction number 1717A, sponsored by Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel, will require the Administration for Children's Services to report on various demographic information, including race, ethnicity, gender, community district, and primary language of parents and children at every step of the child welfare system, and to create a plan to address any disparities identified as a result of such reporting. And next, introduction number 1719A, sponsored by Councilmember Margaret Chin, will require ACS to submit to the council no later than July 31st, 2022, and annually thereafter, information on how long it takes for families of children in ACS custody to visit their child after a placement or transfer, as well as the number of children that are given placements in boroughs other than those which they are from, disaggregated by borough. And the last two bills of the package are sponsored by the chair of the General Welfare Committee, Councilmember Steve Levin, who has worked very, very hard on this package. Introduction number 1729A will require ACS to provide a parent or caretaker written information about their right to request a fair hearing to challenge an indicated report made against a parent or caretaker during an ACS child protective investigation. And lastly, another bill by Chair Levin is introduction number 1727A, which will require the Administration for Children's Services to report on emergency removal cases which, which means the removal of a child out of a home prior to a court hearing when, during the investigation of such report of abuse or neglect, ACS determines that such ch child is not safe at home. And I really want to thank Aminta Kilowan, who has worked very, very hard on this package of bills. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Cornegie, our presiding officer, for leading today's meeting. And I turn it back to Councilmember Cornegie. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. We will now move into discussion of general orders. So uh, first we'll hear from Council Members Rosenthal, then Council Member Adams, then Council Member Lander in that order. Thank you. I'm sorry, and Council Member Kuh, I apologize. everyone on the floor who helps to make sure we're heard. Um, but I really want to thank the speaker for describing my bill. You know, today is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I notice people are wearing the lavender um, mask. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and what better day to acknowledge the fact that the LGBTQ um, AI plus community, and in particular, the TGNCNB community, are underserved in our domestic violence shelter system. Um, the people who make the placements in the system are not educated about how to speak with these individuals. 
they um, misstep and, and really uh, can make people feel terrible, uh, which there's no reason to do that. Um, and the placements are very challenging because shelters, uh, for a variety of reasons, are loath to take this population, which is disgraceful. Our bill will uh, seek to understand, will require uh, Department of Homeless Services to seek to understand better the nuances of this population and uh, make recommendations and indeed change policies um, in order to serve them better. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, Jaisri Ganapathy, Bianca Vitali, my staff, Madhuri Shukla, and um, from the Anti Violence Project, Kat Shagru Dos Santos. She is an amazing advocate, and um, her input was invaluable. Thank you very much. Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, Mr. Presiding Officer, Councilmember Corning. Good to see you up there on that chair, sir. This afternoon, we are voting on a package of legislation that I believe will increase transparency and accountability when it comes to our flawed and often harmful child welfare system. I urge all of my colleagues to vote in favor of this set of parental rights bills. In particular, I want to speak about my bill, Intro 1760A, which would require the Administration for Children's Services to report on the total number of emergency removals of children every quarter. ACS would also be required to disaggregate this information by race, community district, the primary language of each child, and the primary language of the parent or person legally responsible for the child. We already know that our city's child welfare system disproportionately impacts poor New Yorkers, immigrants, and families of color. ACS's own data shows that in 2019, 41 percent of families investigated by ACS were black. 43 percent were Latino. However, we need to know exactly who is impacted by the agency's policy of emergency removals, a separation that inflicts trauma on both the parents and the child alike. Once we're equipped with this detailed data and have it broken down by demographic information, it will be better informed as lawmakers to conduct we will be better informed as lawmakers to conduct oversight over ACS and their actions. We have to do everything we can to keep our families and communities intact and hold. I'm sure that many of my colleagues in this room today, as I do, have stories to share of your constituents who have been impacted by this. That starts by empowering families and making sure that they know and fully understand their rights as parents. It's not easy when ACS investigators come to your home and then take your child away. Parents, especially those who face disadvantages in their daily lives, deserve to know what their options are. We're talking about basic protections and information that should be readily available to those directly impacted by our child's welfare policies, if I may. Two seconds. That's why we need to pass this parental rights package of legislation to shine a brighter light on the outcomes of ACS policies and investigations. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson and Chief of Staff Jason Goldman, for all of your hard work on these bills. I'm grateful for the leadership also of our General Welfare Committee Chair Steve Levin, as well as all of my colleagues who have sponsored such very important legislation in this package. Thank you to the advocates and families who have shared your stories and uplifted the voices of the marginalized. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lander. There we go. Uh, thank you to the presiding officer. I am proud to be the lead sponsor of intro 2404A, which will extend the certificate of no harassment for another five years, strengthen the program to make it work better, and also extend the program citywide. In a moment of skyrocketing rents and expiring eviction moratoria, it is a critical moment to protect tenants from bad actors who use harassment as a tool for displacement, as we see too often. This pilot program was created back in 2018 through a broad partnership of my office, HPD, the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment, and a wide range of stakeholders. We had a broad series of meetings to develop the parameters for the policy. 
uh, which were codified in Local Law 1 of 2018. The program builds on successful certificate of no harassment program that was adopted in the Special Clinton District way back in 1972 and for single room occupancies in 1983. Uh, what the program requires is that owners of buildings which are determined to be distressed, that uh, based on HPD's Building Quality Index, or BQI, get a certification that they have not harassed tenants in order to vacate or demolish or reposition the building before they can get their building permits for significant modifications or demolition. Uh, if landlords are found to have harassed tenants as part of an effort to vacate the building, then their building permits are denied, a strong protection against that model of harassment and displacement. Uh, the renewed version of the program strengthens the 2018 version in several ways. It only applied in about a third of the city, but now it applies to distressed buildings citywide. Uh, the denial of a, a certificate of no harassment now constitutes per se harassment, affording tenants the opportunity to pursue legal action in housing court with a higher likelihood of success. Uh, and finally, tenants who participate in the cone process and whose building owners are denied that certificate because they're found to have harassed will be eligible to receive $5,000 in restitution in addition to the other consequences and remedies. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, finish up in a few more seconds. Uh, big, big thank you to Steph Silkowski, my policy director, who's worked tirelessly on this, to Lewis Cholden Brown here. Lewis, thank you so much. Uh, Jordan Gibbons from HPD, Paul Ochoa and Gabby Dan Allo from the mayor's office. And I'll just say these improvements, like the original legislation itself, would not have happened without the strong advocacy of the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment. Big thank yous to Alex Spinell, Lucy Block, and Barika Williams from ANHD who've led that effort. It's been an honor to work with them to ensure this program will reach more buildings, provide real tangible benefits to tenants, and more effectively dis disincentivize harassment. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kuhl. Thank you, Council Member Carnegie, our presiding officer. Today, we are voting on my bill, intro 1145. This is a small business relief bill that will expand the number of items at retailers exempt from item pricing requirements for individual pieces of merchandise as long as the store makes price scanners available for the, scan, uh, for the consumer. The city mandates this despite a redundant state law that requires item prices uh, to also be displayed on the shelves. My bill would eliminate the sticker gun man mandates and give retail stores the option to use price scanners such as those, such as those already found at larger chain stores like Target. And by using barcodes and scanners, stores can more efficiently implement sales and discounts over their own goods. There is also zero evidence that this bill would result in any sort of job loss. We have asked for data, but there's none. Lasso, Suffolk, and Rochester counties have, been, have all been utilizing this technology for decades with no reported job loss. If anything, retailers are struggling to hire and keep existing employees at this time. This bill will allow small businesses to innovate and improve their business instead of having to scramble to comply with the cumbersome and outdated overregulation. At the end of the day, we are in a small, we are in a retail crisis, and this is common sense step to clean up the law. The pandemic has caused a retail crisis like we have never been before. Uh, majority, may I proceed? Yeah. Yeah. Supermarkets and small retail, supermarkets and small retailers continue to shut their doors, and this is one tangible action we can take to support them. We have all thought about wanting to help small businesses. This is how to do it. For supermarkets in particular, this bill would save them from unnecessary, unnecessary burdensome fines that big boxes, big
big box stores are able to absorb as a cost of doing business. DCWP has voiced their support of this bill, and I urge all my colleagues to do the same. Thank you to the Speaker's Office, especially Speaker Johnson, Jason, and Ebony, the committee staff, Stephanie Jones, Leah Skupiar, and Lower Messler. Our original bill drafter, J.R. Sri Galapapi, uh, I'm sorry that if I mispronounce the names, and all the advocates. And lastly, I want to thank my own staff, Elaine and Scott, for doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Salamanca. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I am speaking on my, uh, my bill that's being voted on today, intro 2373A. Like many New Yorkers, uh, when COVID hit, um, um, I, I lost a loved one. I lost my dad, just like thousands and thousands of New Yorkers throughout the city of New York. Um, and when I received my father's death certificate, uh, it actually stated on the cause of death that he passed through natural causes. And I didn't pay any mind to that uh, until the federal government, uh, they opened up, um, they assigned funding where individuals who had a family member who passed uh, from COVID, you can apply so that you can get some of your federal expenses reimbursed. And so I started receiving calls from my constituents because they too had the same issue. And as a result, in trying to get your death certificate revised, there's a $40 fee that the city of New York was charging to families. And so I just felt that this was a financial burden to New Yorkers that we should not have to uh, pay for. And so that is the motion of this bill, which in reality what it does is that it just waives the fee when a New Yorker is trying to get their death certificate uh, revised. And I really hope that I can have the support of my colleagues today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Koslowitz. On December 11, 2001, the City Council passed intro 0968. It was a bill that I introduced. On December 26, 2001, Mayor Giuliani vetoed the legislation. <clears throat> because this veto occurred, <clears throat> excuse me, because this veto occurred five days from the end of the 1998-2001 legislative session, the council did not have the ability to consider an override. Today, <clears throat> almost 20 years later, the council is considering intro 499. <clears throat> is essentially considering the same bill as intro 0968. Intro 0968 contained lang language authorizing raising the limit on the dollar amount a newsstand operator could charge for an item. This increased <clears throat> dollar limit, <clears throat> my allergies are killing me, <clears throat> operator was achieved during the Bloomberg administration and therefore does not appear in intro 499. Except for the raising of the dollar amount, intro 0968 and intro 0499 are basically identical. Currently, only an additional, an individual can obtain a newsstand license. This bill would permit partnerships, companies, and corporations to obtain a new stand license as well. I got more. I don't talk that much, so. Does someone have a bottle of water, though, for the council member? Why is this important? Because it would enhance the ability of immigrants to obtain a new stand license and thus become and entrepreneurs. 
There are approximately 300 newsstands in operation in our city. These newsstands are overwhelmingly operated by immigrants. That is operated but not owned by immigrants. By expanding ownership to partnerships, companies, and corporations, the current personal license holder would get, be given the ability to bring in the operator as a partner. And when the current license holder retires or passes on, because the definition of ownership is to be expanded, the immigrant operator as a partner would have the ability to become the sole owner, or the immigrant operator would have the ability to buy the license from the licensee. Under current rules, this is not possible. This bill is 20 years old, and today I want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, and Jez Jason Goldman for allowing this bill to come to the council and, and be voted on. So I ask everybody, please vote for this bill. I've waited 20 years. Thank, thank you, council member. Report on special committees. None. Report on standing committees. Report of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, Intro 499A, Newsstand Licenses. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1145A, Item Pricing. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Intro 1919A, Recording of Real Estate Instruments. Amended and coupled on general orders. Preconsidered Resolution 1765, Transparency Resolution. Coupled on general orders. R Report of the Committee on General Welfare, intros 1716A through 1729A, Parental Rights Package. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Health, intro 2373A, Amending Death Certificates. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, intros 2259A and 2321A, Gas Piping Systems. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 2404A, cer Certifications of No Harassment. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LUA 28 and Reso 1766, Dorrance Brooks Square Street, Historic District. Coupled on general orders. LUA 35 and Reso 1767, 101 Varick. Coupled on general orders. LUA 42 through LUA 44, River North. Approved modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. Excuse me. L LUs 852 and 853 and accompanying resolution 6204 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning. Coupled on general orders. LU 854 through 856 and accompanying resolutions 495 11th Avenue. Coupled on general orders. LUs 857 and 858 and accompanying resos 252 Victory Boulevard. Coupled on general orders. LUs 859 and 860 and accompanying resos 270 Nostrand Avenue. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. LUs 861 and 862 and accompanying resos 1776 48th Street rezoning. A approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. LU 863 and reso 1775, 4818 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning. Coupled on general orders. LUs 875 through 878 and accompanying resos 130 Felix Street. Coupled on general orders. St. Felix Street. LUs 879 and 880 and accompanying resos Broadway and 11th Street rezoning. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, Intro 1712A, Domestic Violence Emergency Shelter Reporting. Amended and coupled on general orders. General orders, calendar resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled on general orders, and I am going to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote on all of the items coupled on today's general orders calendar. Councilmember Lewis. I vote aye on all and abstain from 1145A. 1145A, abstain, thank you. Council Member Amprey Samuel. Council Member Amprey Samuel says aye on all. Ayala. 
Councilmember Ayala votes aye. Barron. Thanks. Oh, thank you. On the legislation, I vote aye on all. On the land use items, I vote yes on H28, H35, H63, and no on the remaining items. Council Member Eugene. Council Member Eugene votes aye. Council Member Adams. Councilmember Adams votes aye. Borelli. I vote aye on all except intro 2404 and a brief mention of why you have candles. Uh, this council body funds an organization called the Grace Foundation, uh, which educates and employs developmentally disabled uh, children and adults, uh, mostly people with autism, and they have a candle and soap making factory. So this was a gift I thought you'd all enjoy. So God bless and thank you. Councilmember Brannon. Councilmember Brannon votes aye. Brooks Powers. Commission Granite. Good. Um, so while I am going to vote aye, I just wanted to lift up um, my concerns that I address with the prime sponsor of intro 1145A. Um, just wanting to make mention that we wanna, when we look at legislation as a body, we wanna make sure that while we wanna help our small businesses through these difficult times, we wanna also be sure that we're preserving all jobs um, in the city of New York, including um, the low, lower wage jobs as well. So I did express my concern to the prime sponsor, but I did wanna um, raise that concern. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cabrera. Council Member Chin. Council Member Chin votes aye. Council Member Cornegie. Um, no on 2404A, aye on all the rest. Councilmember Dharma Diaz. Councilmember Dharma Diaz votes aye. Councilmember Ruben Diaz. Councilmember Dinowitz. Councilmember, we need you on the microphone, please. Thank you, sir. I vote aye on all except 1145A, on which I abstain. Thank you. Council Member Drum. Aye. Council Member Drum votes aye. Council Member Felice. Aye. Council Member Felice votes aye. Council Member Gennaro. Aye. Council Member Gennaro votes aye. Council Member Gibson. Council Member Gibson votes aye. Council Member Joni. No on 2404A and I on the rest. Thank you. Council Member Grodenchik. I and all with the exception of 1145A on which I abstain. Council Member Holden. I and all except for intro 2404A, which I vote no. Council Member Kalos. I and all. Councilmember Kalos votes aye. Councilmember Ku. Council Councilmember Ku votes aye. Councilmember Kozlowitz. Councilmember Kozlowitz votes aye. Councilmember Lander. Request permission to explain my vote. Thank you. Um, I am respectfully voting no on 1145A. I do believe it is appropriate to reform item pricing, but I do believe it needs to be done in partnership with workers, both unionized and non-unionized, and with consumer advocates as well. So I'll be voting no on 1145 and I on the rest. Thank you. Council Member 11.
permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank the speaker, uh, Chief of Staff Jason Goldman, um, Council to General Welfare Committee, Amanda Kilowan, uh, Kelly Taylor, Jeff Baker, um, uh, Lou Schulten Brown, for, uh, and, and um, uh, Crystal Pond and Natalie Omari at uh, the General Welfare Committee for working on the ACS um, Accountability Act bills. I want to uh, acknowledge the work of my colleagues, Margaret Chin, um, uh, Adrian Adams, Lika Avery Samuel, um, and uh, and uh, uh, thank every uh, all my colleagues for voting aye on this legislation. It was a lot of work that went into it. Um, and we hope that this will move the needle in terms of accountability um, on behalf of parents who face um, significant challenges when confronted with uh, ACS knocking on their door, um, and um, and having the ability to. Um, to know their rights, to know um, uh, what steps they can take moving forward um, in the best interests of, of their children and their families. And with that, I vote on all. Thank you. Councilmember Levine. Councilmember Levine votes aye. Councilmember Mizell. Yes. Councilmember Mizell votes yes. Councilmember Menchaca. Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Miller votes aye. Councilmember Moya. Councilmember Perkins. Council, Councilmember Powers. Is permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. I'll be voting, voting aye on all. Uh, I just wanted to also can, say uh, my well wishes to Brian Crow. I don't know if he's here today, but during my time in the city council, he's been. Uh, worked on my committee in the criminal justice committee and i know he's going not far away just a few blocks away i want to wish him well wishes as he moves over to manhattan da's office and of course also congratulate our colleague on his wedding he looked great we saw the pictures and with that i'll be voting aye and all thanks councilmember Reynoso. permission to explain my vote permission granted thank you uh uh, first, congratulations to everyone on uh, these bills that are passing. Peter Koo, great job um, in pushing the itemized pricing bill, which I think is a great bill. It's going to help small businesses. Um, and also, it's just um, the times we're in make it so that the itemized pricing is just not necessary. Um, so congratulations to Peter Koo. But I do want to talk about these bills that we're passing from uh, um, regarding to ACS, health and hospitals, and so forth. Um, they're great bills. And I want to congratulate every single council member, especially council member Adams and council member Levin for the great work that they did in passing these pieces of legislation. But there is one piece of legislation that wasn't a part of that, which is intro 1426, was originally part of the package and was pulled out. And what it would do, it would require the New York City Administration for Children's Services or ACS to provide an annual report to the mayor and to the council with information regarding the number of patients who were referred to ACS for investigation as a result of a positive drug screening performed at an h, &H facility. Um, we don't know exactly who and how many people are affected. There's an assumption here that it's mostly black and brown women that are being tested at an unusual rate. And now, because we're not voting on this bill today, it is something that we won't know until we can pass that legislation. It is simply a reporting bill. I don't know exactly why it didn't get on, but it is unfortunate. But I don't want to take away from the great bills that are being passed by Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Adams. So I wouldn't have vote aye on all. Um, and thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Riley. I'll be as abstaining on 1145A and an aye on all. Thank you. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez votes aye. Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rose votes aye. Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Rivera votes aye. Councilmember Moya? No. Councilmember Rosenthal. Councilmember Rosenthal votes aye. Councilmember Salamanca.
Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. I'd like to make a motion for a unanimous consent to vote on all land use call-ups in addition to all items coupled in the general order calendar. I see no objections. Thank you. I vote aye on all. Council Member Traeger. Aye. Council Member Traeger votes aye. Council Member Ulrich. Council Member Vallone. Aye. Council Member Vallone votes aye. Council Member Moya. Council Member Moya votes aye. Council Member Van Bramer. Council Member Yeager. Thank you. I vote aye on all with the exception of introduction 2404. And I would just like to commend the sponsors of the bills coming out of general welfare today. Uh, those are important for reasons I've discussed in the past with some folks here and uh, in our private meetings in the council. Uh, they, they uh, bring justice to a lot of people who need that justice, and I think that that is the right thing to do, and I'm glad we're moving them today. Thank you. Council Member Amadio. Thank you. I'd like permission to uh, for unanimous consent to uh, vote on all land use call-ups. I see no objections. Thank you. I vote yes on that, and I vote no on 2404, and I'm yes on the rest. Thank you. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all. So the results of today's vote are as follows. All items on today's general calendar are adopted. I'm sorry. 
by a vote of 42 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, no abstentions. Intro 2404, with the exception of intro 2404A, which had 36 in the affirmative, six in the negative. And intro 1145A, which had 36 in the affirmative, one in the negative, and five abstentions. Land use items 852 through 858, and LUs 875 through 880, and accompanying resolutions are 41 in the affirmative and one in the negative with zero abstentions. Introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you, there are no re resolutions on today's calendar, so we'll now move into general discussion, beginning with Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem. I want to call attention to a resolution that you'll see listed. It's resolution, resolution 1763, and it calls for stop arms to be on both sides of school buses. The reason being that they're generally on the driver's side, but not on the passenger side. But now that we have protected bike lanes, there's actually traffic moving on that passenger side, and I think that stop arms would allow those bikes and other vehicles in that lane to be aware of children uh, getting off the bus. And that bill is being introduced along with Council Member Rodriguez and Council Member Riley. Well, 20 years ago also, when Charles Barron was here, he called for the removal of that statue and he called Thomas Jefferson a slaveholding pedophile. And since that time, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus has also called for the removal. We sent a letter to the speaker, and the speaker sent a letter to the um, mayor. And on Monday, the Public Design Commission voted to remove, voted unanimously to remove the statue. Still remains where the statue will go. But I have a poem. You know, I was a teacher, and I had lots of ways to try to get my message across. So I wrote a poem, and I've entitled it Human trafficking a la colonial slavery. Kidnapped from Africa, birthplace of humans, severed from family and culture, thrown into confusion, bound and chained, forced to walk to the west, held in dungeons, not castles, where thousands breathe their last breath. Confined and shipped like cargo in coffinesque spaces, months below decks, forced to lie in their waist. Sold at auctions like a horse or a pig to the person making the highest bid. Held in bondage as chattel property. No declaration for us of life and liberty. Exploited of our intellect, uncompensated for our talents and skills. Still, Africans resisted finding ways to undermine the enslaver's will. Raped and forced to mate to increase the enslaver's worth, bearing children for him bound to slavery from birth. Thomas Jefferson said blacks were inferior to whites and displaced indigenous people to a trail that took thousands of their lives. So let's not engage in cognitive dissonance, rejecting new information because it's disconcerting, it just doesn't make sense. No more half lies, which means, no more half truths, which means half lies. Tell it all, embrace the facts that are there before your ears and eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Adams. Thank you very much, Mr. Presiding Officer. How to, how to follow that? but I'm gonna try. On Monday, my co-chair, Councilmember Idunik Miller, co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, myself, Councilmember Inez Barron, and Assemblymember Charles Barron, provided testimony in a public hearing held by the Public Design Commission. The topic was long-term loan of Thomas Jefferson's statue to the New York Historical Society. What was expected of the commission was a date and a confirmation of placement to the New York Historical Society and a vote. 
on such items. The only entity that agreed to house the statue to date is the New York Historical Society, thanks to the due diligence of the speaker and his chief of staff, Jason Goldman. But what we did not get on that day in that hearing was a vote on a date and a confirmation of the placement to the New York Historical Society. We received instead an agreement to remove by the end of 2021, considering other options of placement of the statue. Although it is not expected that the statue will be looking down upon the incoming council membership in 2022, which will be majority people of color, as he is looking down upon us today, it was the hope of the caucus that there would be no further delay to remove the representation monument of one who owned, brutalized, and profited from 600 human beings who looked like me. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Miller to round out today's schedule. Two tough facts to follow. Uh, today is Domestic Violence Awareness Day. Every year there are roughly 66, um, sorry, uh, the number of domestic violence murders has increased over the past 10 years. During the same time period, homicides have, homicides have declined. In 2020, domestic violence made up 20% of all murders. I'd like to ask that we take a moment of silence for all victims of domestic violence, including last month, Shanice Young, who was shot and killed by her ex-boyfriend as she was leaving her own baby shower. Thank you. Thank you, my colleagues. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Miller, I'm sorry, followed by Council Member Levin. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for that acknowledgement. Uh, I first want to uh, talk about an introduction uh, today that will be uh, legislation that will be introducing, along with Chair Cornegie to create an Office of Homeowners Advocate within the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. For the over 70% of New York residents who are renters, homeowners is often a lifetime dream, but attaining and maintaining this dream can be challenging and can also be a nightmare. Homeownership requires support that goes beyond the capacity of individuals, as would be and new homeowners are tasked with navigating a myriad of processes, agencies, in order to maintain their homes. Regular people need, to, need assistance somewhere to turn. There's a one-stop shop for resources, grants, financing opportunities, a catalog of not-for-profits that assist them currently operating within this space. There's also an important homeowner to, for homeowners to understand their responsibility when it comes to maintaining their homes and their surrounding areas. The advocate office would serve as a liaison between agencies and help working families who often don't have the time to navigate these processes themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for your leadership on that. Uh, of course, I, want, I would love to address the hearing that took place this, this past Monday on the removal of the Jefferson statue from these council chambers. While the final motion acknowledged the need to remove the statue, it merely delayed the process significantly. We are deeply disappointed by the slave owner, that the slave owner of more than 600 slaves and one who has impacted the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous people remain in this chambers and need not remain for a moment longer. It is also disappointing that the PDC commission 
themselves were woefully unprepared to discuss this issue, undermining two decades of advocacy, and I stand with my caucus colleagues and my colleagues here in the council in pressing for a swift removal, removal of this statue from the People's House. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Levin. Council Member Levin is our final speaker this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Providing of Presiding Officer. Um, <clears throat> I want to um, associate myself with the remarks of my colleagues, Council Members Miller, Adams, and Barron, um, regarding the Jefferson statue. I um, also want to acknowledge today, um, uh, yesterday a staff member of mine, Deidre Cheatham, uh, was honored by the Urban Resources Institute, um, uh, which provides a, a domestic violence shelter um, for survivors um, and people uh, fleeing abusive relationships here in New York City. She was honored with their Triumph Award um, for her work on, as a, as a resident of a, a former resident of a, a URI shelter, um, domestic violence shelter, for her advocacy for other uh, survivors of domestic violence and, and for her uh, work on legislation that passed this council uh, this past August um, to require the city of New York to develop a plan for um, accommodating pets in shelter so that those people who um, uh, uh, have pets that are part of their families and, and uh, that they love as part of their families um, can take them with them uh, when they are fleeing an abusive and dangerous situation at home. And so I um, just want to offer my congratulations to Deidre Cheatham on her accomplishment yesterday and, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. I will now call on uh, Speaker Corey Johnson to close today's stated meeting. Council Member Cornegie, thank you for presiding over today's meeting. You did a fabulous job, as always. The stated meeting of October 21st, 2021 is hereby adjourned. We have four stated meetings left for the City Council. Thank you all very much. <laughs>